Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, if as a Canadian like me, you are an avid follower of U.S. politics, then David Frum is like an old friend. For more than two decades now, it's hard to imagine, he's been like the most engaging dinner guest. Thoughtful, provocative, gentlemanly. With uh, intelligence and wit, he uses his elegant prose and commentary to illuminate the arcane and dramatic and powerful world of American politics. And from his vantage point in Washington, he also makes us think about politics here, too. At one time, an insider in the Bush White House, he's now, I think it's fair to say, an outsider. Others probably call him a heretic, but he is most certainly a conservative, and yes, a Republican who's truly an independent thinker. Arianna Huffington calls him fearless. He's a contributing editor for the Daily Beast and Newsweek, and you probably see him on CNN as well. He's also a prolific tweeter, if that's the correct word, or twitterer. Um, and from those tweets, uh, I also know he's a devoted husband and father, that his wife and at least one of his daughters know how to land a good punch, and <laughs> recently had a fast lesson in how to care for baby squirrels. But I digress. Uh, David has written six books of nonfiction that essentially chronicle the history of my modern conservatism in the U.S., but more importantly, challenge conservatives and Republicans to examine their beliefs and how they practice politics. This novel, Patriots, is described as a scorching, intimate explanation of why the U.S. political system has so badly failed the American people over the years just past. In it, Republicans are called constitutionalists, Democrats are nationalists. Briefly, the plot line, a constitutionalist president, a military war hero in a wheelchair, has just defeated a black president. The U.S. is involved in a war with drug lords in Mexico, and the economy, not surprisingly, is in the tank. The central character, Walter Schotsky, is the young heir to a mustard fortune, a mustard fortune, <laughs> who finds himself working in a Senate office in Washington. In this story, as in much of David's work, it's a call for thoughtful and considerable change. And just in case you thought it might be all about tax cuts and health care reform, I just want to read you from the first page a little bit. <laughs> hey, I said sleepily, it's 6 a.m. Don't you like it, Valerie murmured from beneath the covers. Do you want me to stop? I like it, I admitted, but I'd like it better at 9. Her tousled brown hair and big matching eyes emerged from below the sheets. We have to be on the road by nine. It's your grandmother's birthday. We're expected for lunch. That's how it starts. <laughs> this is a rollicking, sexy, juicy, funny story that proves there's truth in fiction. Please welcome David Frum. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Where do you want to sit? I, you go there, I'll go here. <laughs> so to begin, uh, I'll put you right to work. The yeah. first most obvious question, why a novel? Um, P.J. O'Rourke, uh, who's a great American humorist, had, had a line that struck me many years ago. That, um, Just as many things are too strange for fiction, so other things are too true for journalism. <laughs> and, and what happens when you live in Washington is you, you amass all kinds of stories and anecdotes uh, that you, for one reason or another, can't use. Um, either you're not 100% certain that they're true, uh, or uh, they occur to people who are very good friends. You, you are certain that they're true, but they involve people who are good friends of yours, and it would be embarrassing to repeat them. Um, or uh, their full significance only strikes you long after everyone else has lost interest in the story. Uh, you collect these things over time. And then in the crisis that has hit the United States over the past three years, um, where I found myself um, in one of those everybody's out of step but my Johnny situations where you know, everyone else is marching in one way and I'm marching in the other way and we all think the other is nuts, that I found, I found myself dealing with people who I thought had lost a sense of reality who also thought then that I had lost a sense of reality. And I became very interested in this question of, you know, why do I think so differently from all of you? And that was something that if you sort of sit down and work it out for yourself, it turns into autobiography. It becomes self-regarding. Whereas if you can tell a story and make it amusing, it can be other-regarding. All right. So 
talk about developing this kind of plot line, I want to ask you a little bit about the process yes. because the books you've written before have been, uh, you know, based on your research and your thinking. Um, this obviously is too, but this is a plot line with twists and turns and vivid descriptions. Where did Walter Schotsky come from? I I've been living with Walter Schotsky in my head for a long time. And the first line of the novel I've ha had probably in mind for um, almost a decade, um, but that was it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then during uh, the Tea Party storm, um, I, I became interested, uh, I, I had various sort of stories that I was watching. And so what happens with, with Walter, the first line of, of the novel is that I, I didn't get my girlfriend through, uh, I, sorry, I didn't get the job through merit, my girlfriend had pointed out, but then I didn't get my girlfriend through merit either. And uh, Walter is, um, he's not a fool, but he is um, not one of the world's smartest people, unlike his girlfriend, who is one of the world's smartest people. And he is put into a situation where he is, he's thrust into the middle of Washington and becomes our observer. And he also, I was interested in him because he, he does inherit a lot of privilege, and he represents the incredible out of touchness of the American economic elite through the uh, cataclysm that that society has lived through. And one of the things that happens to Walter is he becomes more aware um, of how flip, he's got a, problems in his life and how flimsy they are and, of how un, and how he has to be more other regarding himself. You've often said that yourself about about politics and the, and the meaning of politics, yes. that you, we need to be aware of what we have. Well, there's the, the, one of the, in the first paragraph of The Great Gatsby, um, the narrator uh, quotes something his father says to him, uh, which is, um, whenever you're tr tempted to criticize anybody, uh, be aware that not everybody in life has had the advantages that you have had. And my mother quoted that line to me probably 5,000 times before <laughs> I understood where it came from. Uh, and, and, and as I watch what has happened in Washington over the past five, I think they should put it in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they don't. No, they, they, they don't. Um, they don't. And what, what, one of the things that is very strange about um, American politics right now is, you know, that, I mean, if you live in Washington, if you live in certain areas of New York, uh, the country has never felt richer. Uh, that the, um, that the, Re damage from the recession is entirely repaired. In this way, it's not like the Great Depression. Um, it's been very, very, the recovery for those uh, who have done well has been very rapid and dramatic and better than ever. But for 80% of the country, the situation is, is somewhere between bad, grim, horrible. And yet, in this situation, if you watch the debate, certainly on the Republican side, that, that the mood of, of uh, persecution um, is, uh, so, so extreme. It's the Senator Hazen, who's sort of the conscience of the book. He's this, the last of the moderate New England constitutionalists in the book, um, and who is, you know, who is from the business world and who does sympathize broadly with the interests of the business world, does say that his rich, uh, at one point, you know, he's talking, he's complaining about fundraising, and Walter says to him, at least fundraising keeps you in touch with the people. And he says, I'm in very close touch with the people who own private aircraft. <laughs> which is a line actually once said to me by a, a former U.S. senator talking about his fundraising. Um, and, and then Walter complains, well, you sound like a radical. He says, I'm no radical. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm a, um, someone who believes in, in business. I just wish that the rich didn't spend all their time feeling so sorry for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so how much of the book is based on experience but imagined, and how much of it is real experience here? Well, uh, the book is not in any way autobiographical. Um, I, am, I am not Walter Schotsky, at least I hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no mustard in your family. <laughs> no mustard, yeah. um, but uh, but this, a lot of the stories are, are true, and a lot of the, um, they're recombined, and a lot of the characters are based on real life personalities. Uh, and that is more true of the minor characters than of the major characters. And some of, a lot of the dialogue, I mean, one of the things I warn people about in the book is you will come across passages that seem impossible that any human being, that, how could I write such a thing? How could anybody say anything so stagey, so corny, so histrionic, so strident? So, well, that's taken from a Fox News transcript. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you want to read it? Did you bring the, I know there was, you've got a couple of examples in the book here that uh, well, were particularly good. Um, I, I, I had a few little things here. I need my reading glasses, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, the Walter and there, there's some comic, some comic, a couple of things, and a comic thing, and then maybe a serious thing. Um, here's a uh, 
comic thing that Walter and Valerie go to the inaugural ball of the incoming president, General Pulaski. Um, <coughs> this is the hero you mentioned. And you've probably, if you've read about them, you imagine an inaugural ball and you imagine something tremendously glamorous. The women in beautiful dresses, uh, something Viennese. Uh, and anyway, so this is uh, more what it's, what it's like. Um, that as, as they walk in, uh, Walter said, well, speaking in Walter's voice, I surveyed the crowd. And then he says to Valerie, do you think we might have come to the wrong place? At that moment, we were passed by a man wearing a, mu wearing a mullet haircut and a bright red tie studded with little lights that switched on and off at two second intervals. <laughs> Looks that way, said Valerie. Somehow I imagined an inaugural ball would be less gross. <laughs> Maybe it would be better in the VIP room? I glanced down at the secondary ticket atop my general admission pass. Maybe, said Valerie, not very hopefully. And then they go into the VIP room, which turns out to be an exhibition, uh, the VIP room turns out to be an exhibition space that opened off the museum's main, main hall. The placard was illustrated, uh, and uh, as they, they're standing in line, uh, they are crashed into by a man on his way on the, on the, on the, um, on his way to the canapes. And uh, they, Walter sort of looks around in despair and says, God, this is grisly, I said to Valerie. Do you think it was like this when the Romans inaugurated a new emperor? <laughs> Um, but there's. Uh, tell me this. Tell me this, just before we came in, you told me the story about going with your wife to okay. that. Well, this is actually yeah. based on. Uh, this is set in the Air and Space Museum, and this is based on our experience uh, going to the George Bush inaugural in 1988. And this line, which um, I quote, which I man said, man appro as they're standing there. Um, uh, they're looking lost. Uh, they're standing beside a display of moon rocks, reconnoitering the situation. A drunken party goer came stumbling up to Valerie, an older guy, heavy, wearing $5,000 worth of ugly oversized wristwatch. Are you, uh, are you a wife? He couldn't get his tongue working properly. The word emerged as wife. Or are you a prostitute? Uh, you will never know what's going to upset Valerie and what will make her laugh. This time she laughed. Why can't I be both? Um, <laughs> Actually, a man approached my wife at the 1988 inaugural and said just that, and that was Danielle's answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one of the young men who worked with you on your blog, uh, Noah Crystal Green, yeah. wrote about you as he was leaving, and he said this. He said that you are a deeply cynical man, and I mean this in the most flattering and positive way. <laughs> David always assumes a political actor is motivated by the desire for power, sex, or money. And I was going to say, and I thought you were an idealist. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, that was the one thing in Noah's, in Noah's very generous statement I, I didn't think was quite right. Um, but Noah is a very idealistic person, and so I may sometimes shock him. For me, it's, <laughs> it's what the lawyers would call a rebuttable presumption. OK. <laughs> but clearly, in this book, they're all motivated yes, by power, sex, or money. Well, ex uh, power, yes. My, but my, my two biggest villains in the book, um, one is an idealist. One, one, one of, the, of the two main villains, one is a total cynic. Um, and he is somebody who deliberately sets out to inflame public opinion, uh, utterly indifferent to the, uh, the truth of what he's saying. And it's despite ever mounting evidence that what he's saying is, is not true. It's just not interesting to him. But the other is a genuine believer. and. Uh, the genuine believer ends up doing even worse things than the truly cynical person. And, and the question you're asked to confront is, you know, maybe genuine believers are uh, worse. Are worse. And, and these are both based on, these are two, con, con, they, con, they are containers of two types. But both of them, I think, would be, if you were in Washington, would be fairly recognizable uh, personalities. That certitude, that sort of genuine believer, there's no way but my way, it exemplifies the Tea Party in many ways. Right. But it, the Tea Party, look, one of the things that, that made me do this book is um, you have to have tremendous sympathy for the people who go to the rallies and do the work and constitute the rank and file of the Tea Party. I and mean, they're living through a social calamity. They, the human beings need explanations. They want, they want to know why did this happen, assure me that it wasn't my fault, uh, and that they are frightened that if you are somebody in the United States on the verge of retirement, you're confronting a situation where you're 
even if you have handled your stock market portfolio well, that is if you didn't panic and sell at one of the market drops, which a lot of people do, it's worth no more today than it was in the year 2000. Your house is worth less. Um, the, clearly th that if you are in your, you know, on the verge of retirement, you're in your early 60s, the deal the state provides you in your retirement years will not be as good when you're in your 80s as it is for the people who are currently in the 80s. And your children face a bleak future. Uh, and so you are ready to be led or you're ready to be misled. And one of the themes of the book is how does it happen? Uh, how does it happen that, that these people who have real anxieties and real fears, and I hope I'm sympathetic to them, um, get abused in, in the way that they do? And one of the forces in the book, and, and that's, the, that's what the, the motive of the book is, the, the, the question, the plot of the book is that um, how a small number of people set in motion these fears. I was gonna say, do you think it's it's fear that sustains the extreme of the conservative yes. movement in the United States? Yes, I think it's tremendous fear. Um, both fear for themselves and fear for uh, what's going to happen to people like them. Um, that will, will their country have room for them? And the, uh, you know, if you are um, 60, you grew up in the uh, United States. It was a very middle class country um, that was defined by the middle class, it was defined by manufacturing. Uh, and where there were some, where, where you know, the rich people were, um, you know, the richest man in the country in the year 1962 was, was J. Paul Getty, a man who's, it's estimated that in present money his fortune would be a billion dollars, which is a lot of money, but you know, it's one billion dollars. And J. Paul Getty was not very active in politics. Um, he didn't give to politicians, he didn't own political parties, he didn't pick presidents. Um, and, the con and when elections happened, that yeah, people who had money mattered, but so did the unions, and so did the Knights of Columbus, and so did the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church mattered a lot. And the idea of politics as a competitive struggle of um, enormously powerful private people with very particular interests who might choose, who, who may choose to be public spirited, but may choose not to be. But if they don't choose to be, there's nothing really much to make them. That's a new country, and the country's changing ethnically as well. And that's an unsettling thing so for what, people. So what changed it to make it this cutthroat blood sport, do you think? Because it's only worsened, it's deepened, even since I was there in 2005, 2009. Yeah. It's, it's much more rancorous. I mean, it doesn't get it much worse than it yes. gets I, in here. I would say what's but. changed are, um, many things. Let me, let me point to, to three as especially notable. Um, the first is, I mentioned, would, uh, the effect of economic pressure. Right. That one of the things that a democracy likes to be able to do is to say to everybody, okay, you keep what you have and I'll keep what I have. And what we'll argue about is there's going to be an increment of economic growth. Uh, and we, what we're going to argue about is who gets how much of the new money. Well, people are much more relaxed about the allocation of new money than they are about the reallocation of old money. But when you're in a situation as you are now where um, the United States is going to disappoint people, uh, that the tax rate uh, is not, if the health care benefits for retirees are to stay as they are, then the tax rates can't stay as they are. If the tax rates are to stay as they are, then the health care benefits for retirees can't stay as they are. And so everybody is going to have the experience of losing, of having something taken away from them. So that's the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing is um, because of the huge immigration into the United States, 40 million people since 1970, uh, E economic redistribution inevitably becomes ethnic redistribution, and that is always more bitter. And that's one of the sub-themes of mm -hmm. the book. And the last thing is the change in the media, where you have, a, and that's one of the major themes of the book, and that's maybe something to read in a moment if we like, uh, that you have a new, more partisan media that exist uh, to generate audience exactly by inflaming these kinds of fears. And that's, and we see there's a sinister cable news network called Patriot News that we see through this novel doing just that. Um, and very, uh, and, and the people in it are do it both consciously, but it's also quite tragic because they, they put things on the air that they know to be false and then they watch them and they believe them. Yes, I, I, well we've all watched that happen. Do you want to read the little section you were yeah. talking about? Yes, um, uh, let me give you an, ex an example. Um, of this. So uh, Walter, in his feckless way, um, has 
inadvertently stumbled into having, into cheating on his girlfriend with uh, a woman who it turns out is the mistress of the um, uh, largest, uh, of the largest and most powerful of these cable news networks. And, and that leads Walter into a lot of trouble. Um, and, uh, uh, but what he gets, she gives him kind of a, she's a very bitter person and she doesn't really like Walter that much. Um, she's just sort of bored and unhappy and miserable and she's about to be dumped anyway. Um, uh, but she, she and they have this, this conversation about how does Patriot News work. So, um, uh, and she really hates it and Walter watches it sometimes. So Walter says to her, I, I watch Patriot News, I said. It's kind of sensational and maybe it's not the most accurate news in the world, but I don't see what's so indecent about it. Why, why do you think people watch Patriot News? Because the info babes are so hot? Yes, that helps. Uh, maybe on the way home we can make a betting pool on which one O'Grady, that's the uh, head of the network, will choose to replace me. Uh, but our primetime li lineup is full of ugly old men and they do even better. I'd take you over any of the info babes any day, I said, not very truthfully, but go ahead, tell me. <laughs> why? And she says, you must have seen that ad we run for carbon monoxide detectives, de detectors. She imitated an announcer's gravelly voice. There's an invisible killer lurking inside your home. She giggled at her audacity. For a second, her humor, se her humor seemed good-natured. Then the bitterness returned. That's what we tell them every moment of the day, in every story and every commercial. They are surrounded by danger. The enemy is everywhere, cunning, ruthless, merciless. The authorities, at best, pitiful and incompetent, but more often corrupt and duplicitous. Now we are testing a new plot line. This, uh, and then the, the, we, she just summarizes, this goes into the events of the story, but the point of the plot line is the viewers can trust nobody and nothing, except Patriot News, of course. And Walter tries a, a, a little uh, joke and they, they um, and uh, she, um, Sylvia becomes impatient with him and uh, she says, in our, um, she says, our audience is so old, they remember when there was this thing called the news. She dropped into an imitation of a grave announcer's voice, and that's the way it is. <laughs> she took a long sip of the Armagnac. But Michael O'Grady doesn't believe in that's the way it is. He doesn't believe it's his job to report reality. He be believes it's his job to make reality. You're saying that most CEOs think they are God, but Michael O'Grady actually is God? Walter, you are really quite a good-looking boy. You don't have to try to be funny, too. It doesn't work for you. <laughs> um, you also don't suggest in that book that the Democrats are any more uh, virtuous no. than the no, Republicans. I, I, well, what, the, the Demo the, this is set inside the Republican world, but one of the Democratic characters we meet is a super lobbyist um, whose uh, name is uh, David Maurice, born David Moritz, and he's one of the most uh, corrupt people in the whole book, um, but he always is reminding everybody that he got his start um, as an anti-apartheid campaigner, and now he lives, um, he makes his home, he has a huge mansion on River Road, which is a fancy street in Washington, and he has his summer retreat on the eastern shore of Maryland where he lives at, at, um, at a country house which he calls Mandela Farm. 